pick up that glass of Pinot Grigio, your drink of choice, and come have some fun with us on Turtle Time. We're going to do more than just drink and party on this podcast, Mom. I know, I know. Okay, if you don't know who I am, well, I'm Ramona Singer, and that's my daughter, Avery. And you probably know us best from the Real Housewives of New York. And now you'll get to know us even better on our podcast, Turtle Time. Let's make more iconic moments together every Wednesday. It's Turtle Time. Follow, rate, and review now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, on April 12, 1962, Yuri Gagarin became the first person in space. At least, that's what they want you to believe. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my deeply missed co-host, Alice. She's back. <laughs> hey, Brett. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, kind of. I'm still utterly sleep-deprived, but we are back to recording, at least trying. I was just telling Brett that, like, I just got three kids to nap at the same time, and we'll see how long this lasts. So this might be a very short episode. Or, you know, <laughs> everyone's smiling upon me and the impossible has happened, which is three yes, triple naps yes. co-aligned in space. In space. Did you we see just that? like to make... There you go. You have it so good, Alice. You just keep coming with the puns. <laughs> I'm back. Like you're I'm back. back in it. You're back in it. Yeah, it's funny. We just trying to make this harder and harder on ourselves. We start out with one podcast, and we had, I had one kid, we you had, had two, no. and then I had two kids, and then we had two podcasts. Now you have three kids. It's like, the, oh my goodness. The metrics were really not. The math is not working out in our favor. I don't know what we're thinking. We're really bad at math, apparently. Crazy people. I mean, we're just crazy people. But anyways. I could just talk to you all day, Alice. We could just do an episode of Chit Chat. I'm sure people would love that. Um, That'd be their favorite episode. That ever. will be the most one starred of all one star episodes. I know. <laughs> but with that, I said, always wait, Brett. I, no, I, I got more to say. I got more to say. I, I can't. I can't. No, just I just keep going. I, you I've keep missed going. you so much, Alice. <laughs> don't worry about the chit chat. We can talk as long as we want because the people who skip all of this anyway, the ones who hate it, we don't care about those people, and they're not going to hear us say that because they're skipping it. So it's the people who listen that we love. That's right. And they're loving this. Okay, wait. Can I they're can I it. say something real quick about our awesome fans? I have never felt so much support postpartum than with our fans after this last baby. I mean, the like excitement that people showed. I mean, I think they were more excited than I was. That's not really true. But the gallery, our Facebook group that's run by fans like was exploding with support. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, guys, I was like literally in the hospital bed just scrolling through the gallery at all hours of the night because, you know, they like come in every 30 minutes to check your blood pressure and not let you sleep. So I just basically stayed up and read gallery posts. (laughs) So thank you guys for keeping me entertained for the early days. Yeah, you guys are awesome. And you've always been so supportive. And we love you so much. So thank you for that. And thank you for Taking care of Alice as she's as she's recovering. Maternity leave has to come to an end at some point. Guys, my, my Alice, baby. You gotta put you back to work. <laughs> I was gonna say, my baby's still like barely a month old, but <laughs> it feels like the coffee's starting to kick in. <laughs> right. Yeah, this you know, this is in Australia where apparently you get like a year off. That's pretty I don't know. amazing. You know, that's pretty awesome. Anyways, okay, that's probably enough. That's probably enough. <laughs> I'm going con- to contain myself. Well, he- here's why I want to contain you. ourselves, because I really want to get to this episode. Because if you guys remember, last year we had the amazing opportunity to pair with the best school, best elementary school that then spurred the best bloopers of all times, Lidditz Elementary. And we got to pair with them again, and they blew us away with their research and their theories. And spoiler alert, maybe it is aliens. This time it might actually be aliens because we are talking about space we were talking about the early days of the space race 
when the United States and the Soviet Union were going against each other to see who could master space first and eventually reach the moon. And while the United States eventually was the first and only up to this point country to put a person on the moon, it didn't start off that way. The Soviet Union was far ahead of the United States in their ability to put people into space. And that led to some real sort of conspiracy theories that may have some... I don't know, some substance to them. So yes, thank you so much to the kids at Lidditz Elementary. Y'all were awesome. We enjoyed talking to you about this case so much. Thank you for all your research and the timelines and the theories. Super helpful. And I hope as you're listening to this episode, we included a lot of what you guys talked about because it was great and we enjoy that so much. And thank you to the teachers and the administration for letting us take part in that. So for those of you who don't know this story, let's dive right in. We are talking about the legend of the lost cosmonauts. So conventional wisdom will tell you that no human has ever left the solar system. And that is certainly true. Well, no living human, at least. But according to some, a tragic accident struck the Soviet space program that sent a cosmonaut careening into deep space with no hope of ever returning. And that's not the only tragedy that befell the Soviet program in the earliest days of space flight. In fact, there were many, each more bizarre than the last. But did they really happen? Or is this just an urban legend born of a heated competition and the notorious secrecy of the Soviet Union? It turns out the answer is complicated. And Alice, before we even get into this, I gotta say, this may be a legend, but if it is, it is one of the f- most frightening legends. It is hard for me to imagine anything more terrifying than being in space and and being sort of shot off away from the Earth with no way to return and just seeing home drift away into the darkness. I mean, that, that just sends chills down my spine. I mean, it's quite literally been the plot line of multiple Hollywood blockbusters because I think it strikes deep within, you know, every human's core. In the ocean, maybe there is the possibility you'll find, you know, an island or you'll be able to be washed on shore or someone's going to rescue you in a ship. If you are even in a plane that's being downed, maybe somehow you'll be able to be ejected and survive or you'll have a parachute or you'll have a soft water landing. But there is no hope for you if you are floating out into space. You know that your air is limited. It will run out. You cannot float and breathe, you know, infinite amount of time. And the temperature is completely inhospitable to life. Everything in space is inhospitable to life. So unlike every other situation in our understanding of the world where you might have a possibility of surviving, there is no such thing as survival in space. And I think that's why it's so terrifying, Brett. And I mean, if you guys have seen the movie Gravity, you know, Sandra Bullock's in the movie and there's the scene where she begins to float off or one of them starts floating off into space. I did the very unwise thing of watching that movie at night in an airplane. <laughs> I was like, this is, it like gave me real anxiety and I started kind of hyperventilating. I was like, ah, space is not the same as an airplane. I have to turn this movie off. But I, I really do think that's why if this is just an urban legend, it strikes at something very deep in all of us, which is we recognize that there's absolutely no hope. It is truly hopeless for life if you are in fact floating out into space. And we're going to give you guys a timeline of the events that some people have speculated occurred in the early days of the space race. Under understand that we're giving you the times and the dates of things that may have happened, but obviously a lot of this is not confirmed. The official story, as we said at the beginning, is that there was no one in space until April 12th, 1962. But these stories make you wonder. So this takes us all the way back to 1957. And though this may seem like some historical story, This is incredibly timely because, you know, the United States actually just announced their newest team of astronauts to travel to the moon in decades. And so this is something that, you know, space and space exploration is not something that is left in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. It very much is something that we explore today. And we haven't even begun to explore a fraction of the universe. And so this is a story that goes back, you know, 50, 60 years, but really it's just as timely today as ever. So let's go back to October 4th, 1957. The Soviets launched Sputnik, the first artificial satellite. Two brothers, 25-year-old Achille and 18-year-old Gian Battista Giudica Cordiglia. That's beautiful. Not the way I said it, but how it would actually be said. 
These two brothers hear the news broadcast on a radio they built themselves. Where they lived in Turin, Italy, was in the orbital flight path of Russian launches. And these brothers were just curious. They loved building things. They were incredibly smart. I don't know how to make radios of my own. But they were able to actually use their radio that they built to record the signal from Sputnik. These amateur brothers, they're not part of any sort of research lab or anything like that. From this point forward, the brothers would continuously upgrade their equipment, eventually moving into an old German bunker to catch these radio signals. By mid-1958, they were regularly recording the signals from both Russian and American satellites. I mean, talk about an incredible hobby. These are things that governments are trying to do, right? During the space race, especially governments want to know what other countries are doing. But these are just two amateur brothers, quite literally, almost ET style, sticking satellites in the air and catching these signals that governments themselves would want to catch. And you might think, how is it possible that they can do this and governments couldn't? A lot of it is being in the right place at the right time. You know, the flight paths of a spaceship, if you've watched some of these launches where now they'll show you exactly where the spacecraft is and where it's going, you notice it's not like the thing just goes around the Earth in a perfect circle. Oftentimes, number one, it's traveling in sort of these these strange up and down, around the Earth motions. I mean, there's all sorts of mathematics and science that goes into what the best flight path for any particular launch is. But where the Russians were launching their spacecraft, they're basically going down from Russia and right over where these guys are. So they're in the perfect place, and they're actually listening. At this point, this very early point, everybody's trying to catch up and figure out how to do this. I mean, they are converting old missiles that the Nazis had built, basically, into spacecraft. The United States and the Russians stole a bunch of Nazis. The Russians got some Nazis. The United States got some Nazis. We took all our Nazis to Huntsville, Alabama. They took all their Nazis to a secret city and that's, like, basically in Kazakhstan now. And they re-engineered these German v2 missiles into rockets to go into space and so everybody's just figuring out as they go eventually this will be commonplace and the americans will be listening to everything the russians do and the russians will be listening to everything the americans do but they're not doing that right now so there really is a lot of mystery about what's going on in space and these guys were just in the right place at the right time absolutely and again that's why their curiosity is great they didn't build this radio in order to catch sputnik really they were just hobbyists and they happened to catch kind of this once in a lifetime radio signal and they continued to follow it and on december 10th 1959 the ap ran a story indicating that u.s intelligence believed that a number of soviet space flights had failed in 1957 and 1950 This was seemingly confirmed by a communist source in Prague who said that four cosmonauts, three men and one woman, were lost in accidents during attempts to put a person in space. Now, this is fascinating. Note a few things here. It's a two-year span of kind of being more advanced in the space race than anyone had believed the Russians were. And also note that the ratio is three men and one woman who were lost in space. At this time, I don't think any country really had women, cosmonauts, or astronauts. I mean, Russia was really advanced in their time on that. So I think that's just relevant there because keep in mind that may come back in a little bit of time through our timeline. So in October 1960, Robert Heinlein, who is a famous sci-fi writer, is traveling in Russia. And he's told by authorities that the Soviets have just launched a manned spacecraft, Korobol Sputnik 1. You can imagine why they would do this. If they can put a person in space, it's one thing to put Sputnik. I mean, Sputnik is the simplest possible thing. You know, you send basically a round sphere with an antenna into space. It sends beeps. It basically, it's a beeping signal. And it just blew everybody away that you could do that. It was terrifying, the notion that a Soviet satellite is traveling over the heads of Americans and there's nothing you can do about it. It was such a victory and they wanted to follow that up. Like Alice said, in just a couple years, we're putting somebody in space. Now Robert Heinlein's there, perfect time, American, sci-fi writer. And we're going to tell him, while you're here, we are going to put a person in space. It just happened. But... Something happened to this spacecraft. There was some sort of mechanical failure, and basically the spacecraft gets stuck essentially forever in Earth orbit. It can't re-enter. Now, 
eventually it will its orbit will degrade just because of orbital mechanics and it will burn up but for the foreseeable future it's stuck up there so if somebody's in it tough luck you're not coming home and the soviets announce officially oh that was an unmanned mission we're just figuring things out we're just getting something else in orbit no big deal obviously that conflicts with what they told heinlein and you have to wonder they're trying to go for a propaganda victory with heinlein something goes wrong they don't want to admit the error so they say oh it was unmanned no big deal. On November 10th, 1960, according to some, a cosmonaut named Belokhanev speculated to have died in an accident while in Earth orbit. This is pretty close to when this Heinlein issue happened. The best proof for this is the Soviet response to the story. A journalist and cosmonaut candidate named Yaroslav Golvanov, who covered the Russian space program for decades, wrote that this claim was false and it was a stain on the honor of the Soviet space program. And a lot of people have wondered, seems like the lady doth protest too much. Is this a situation in which something terrible happened? And if it weren't true, the Soviets just let it go, no big deal. But since it was, they come out with this big propaganda push to say, no, 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 nothing like that happened. Now fast forward to February 2nd, 1961. Now you have a situation where the Judica Cordiglia brothers are coming back into the picture. They're monitoring these launches the Soviets are doing. And they pick up a transmission from an orbiting satellite unlike anything they had heard before. It sounds to them like a person, like someone breathing but having a lot of trouble doing it. They record the sound and they play it for a doctor. In fact, their father was a doctor who specialized in respiratory illness, and they were told, this sounds like someone suffocating. So now they are really interested, and they're really dialed in to following all these Soviet launches. I mean, talk about the kind of, if this is an urban legend, man, the thought of hearing someone suffocating to death in space is just tragic and thrilling and terrifying all at the same time. And like Brett was saying, they had to be at the exact right place at the exact right time to be able to essentially hear this person be gasping for their last breaths if this is in fact what they think they hear. Now on February 4th, 1961, the Soviets announced that they'd lost a prototype spaceship that had burned up on re-entry. And the date it was lost? February 2nd, the exact day that the brothers say that they picked up the sounds of someone suffocating. And though the Soviets claimed the ship was unmanned, you're beginning to see this story take shape and whether we should trust what the Soviets were saying about these quote unquote unmanned failed missions. On May 19th, 1961, the brothers intercept a transmission in Russian. They record it and Lucky for them, they really have like all of the resources within their family. They don't speak Russian, but no problem because their sister does speak Russian and she is able to translate this recording for them. They are astonished by what they hear. They hear, come in, come in, come in, listen, come in, talk to me. I am hot, I am hot, come in, what? 45, what, 50, yes, 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 breathing, oxygen, oxygen. I am hot, this... Isn't this dangerous? Transmission begins now. 41. Yes, I feel hot. I feel hot. It's all, it's all hot. I can see a flame. I can see a flame. I can see a flame. 32. 32. Am I going to crash? Yes. Yes. I feel hot. I'm listening. I feel hot. I will re-enter. I'm hot. Then the transmission went dead. And we're going to play the recording of that transmission for you. Those of you who speak Russian, perhaps you can verify that this is indeed the translation. But what I've just read to you, I mean, talk about a terrifying capture if whatever is happening to this person, whether it's coming from space, whatever is happening, this person is clearly in distress. Thank you. 
So you heard that yourself, and it seems like it's a woman who is speaking it. And just within a week of the brothers hearing this, really what it sounds like is someone's getting very hot, and also note the last words they say is, I will reenter. About a week later, on May 26, 1961, the Soviets announced the loss of an unmanned vehicle during reentry. Again, note that conveniently, this failed reentry is yet again unmanned, or so the Soviets state. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the brothers and their claims later on. There are a couple things that people point to. I mean, this is this is a blockbuster recording, right? I mean, if this is real, this is history in sort of its purest form. So a lot of people have attempted to debunk this. And a couple things people said. Number one, that the sister does speak Russian, so maybe it's the sister. And there are times when you're listening to it where it does seem like she has sort of an Italian accent but doesn't mean a Russian woman couldn't sound the same way. So I don't know if that's definitive. The other thing people say, which I actually find less convincing than that, is that there's too much sort of slang, Russian slang in this, for this to be a professional. But remember the situation. This person would be burning up on re-entry in a very bad situation, trying to reach mission control, not hearing them, panicking, trying to stay calm. I don't know that the transmission would be super technical. You know, like, I mean, just imagine it's an American. Houston, Houston. Yes, Houston, we're burning up on reentry. Temperature is rising. We've reached 100 degrees in the capsule. I mean, no, it's not going to sound like that, right? Like, you're going to start to panic. So I don't necessarily know that that's that convincing. But obviously, you got to take this with a huge grain of salt because... It is such a a striking recording. Absolutely. And also, we'll talk more about the woman saying it, but like these sorts of things, it's clearly one-sided and she's clearly talking or hearing from someone as well. And it's hard to know like where else you could get this sort of a recording if the brothers didn't fake it. And it's, look, it's well faked if it's fake because it's not a clear recording. It's, it, you can barely make it out at times. It seems like something that's being picked up over a radio, not something that's being recorded, you know, up close. Look, people are really good at faking things. <laughs> like people are have faked some awesome stuff in the past in the efforts to fool people and have done just a fantastic job. I mean, they have there was a story not too long ago about a piece of I'm not it was like a it was some sort of writing on a piece of wood that was found in Jerusalem, and it was the first time ever that we had an example of this kind of writing that dated from this time. And it turned out that a professor had made it like a couple months ago in an effort to demonstrate something to their students, and then they just left it behind on accident. And then another scientist comes along and finds it and thinks it's a real thing. So you can fake things and be really convincing, even if you don't mean to be. So not saying this isn't fake, but certainly something to think about and something to consider. And the timing of all these things is so compelling in a real way. Every time you have one of these incidents, a couple days later, you'll have the Soviets saying, oh, we had an accident, you know, something burned up in reentry. And to a certain extent, 
that itself is a little weird because the Soviets don't tend to go out of their way to point out when things go bad. So if the Soviets are telling you that something bad happened, something worse happened. I mean, that's like the iron law of Soviet news broadcast. If they tell you something bad happened, look out because something really bad happens. You know, Chernobyl, there was an accidental release of radioactive material, but it's been contained. In reality, the whole plant blew up, you know? So that's the sort of thing you get from the Soviets. So the fact that they're saying, yeah, we had a little accident, means there probably was something more to it. That's a great point, Brett. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, look, they're just... <laughs> I mean, that's, that really is a great point. Like, they are not ones to say mea culpa. So when they say even a little bit mea culpa, there's probably a lot more under that veil. Yeah, it's maxima mea culpa, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So fast forward to April 8th, 1962. So now we're getting really close to when someone actually goes into space. And one of the most famous people in the Soviet aerospace program, Vladimir Aleutian. He's a fast test pilot. Think of the guy who broke the sound barrier, Chuck Yeager. I mean, he's like the Chuck Yeager of Russia. He's the son of an acclaimed Soviet aerospace engineer. He's the kind of person that if the Soviets were going to put somebody in space for the first time, he's the kind of guy they would want to do it. But on April 8th, it's reported that he's been injured in what's described as a serious car accident. But according to some in the Soviet Union, Aleutian's injuries were really the result of a space launch. According to them, it was Aleutian and not Gagarin, who had entered Earth orbit for the first time. But on re-entry, he crash-landed in China afterwards. There are a couple problems with that. Number one, he had some pretty serious injuries. They were very extensive, and he was going to require a lot of time to recover. And they were so extensive that the Soviets, they couldn't really announce a successful mission. And he landed in China. Some of you may think, no big deal. The Chinese are communists too. All the communists love each other. They sing the Internationale and, you know, dance around the hammer and sickle. In reality, the Soviet Union and the Chinese were basically in a land war for the better part of 50 years. They didn't particularly like each other very much. Mao had the Mao thing and Stalin had the Stalin thing. And so they were sort of in a falling out, particularly at this point, because Khrushchev had come into power. Khrushchev had repudiated Stalin and the cult of personality around him, which was a problem for Mao, because Mao was big on the cult of personality. So crash landing in China was a problem. And according to the people who will tell you this is what happened, Aleutian was actually arrested and kept in a Chinese prison hospital for some time until he could be returned to the Soviet Union. So we can't announce this as a successful launch. And so instead, they created the myth of Gagarin's flight to cover things up. Four days later, on April 12th, 1962, they launched Yuri Gagarin into space, and he officially became the first person in space. So Gagarin's a hero of the Soviet Union. He's one of the most important people in the entire country. Well, the space program for the cosmonauts, it continues. They're trying to put someone on the moon. They're developing new technology. But unfortunately, a lot of that technology has flaws. By this point, the CIA has caught up with things. A lot of these sort of mysteries go away. When tragedies happen, everybody knows about it. Well, fast forward to 1967, which just so happens to be the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the Soviet Union. The Soviets want to do something spectacular to mark this occasion, and they have a brand new capsule, the Soyuz 1, that is supposed to be the thing that is going to launch them forward and enable them to reach the moon first. The problem was this spacecraft had a lot of problems, so many problems, hundreds of problems, as a matter of fact, that Yuri Gagarin, who was supposed to be first in line to fly, suggested we got to postpone this. Well, they couldn't do that. The Soviets wouldn't accept that. We got to do it this year. It has to be on the 50th anniversary. And so they asked one of his best friends, instead of Gagarin, who we can't afford to lose, Vladimir Komarov to, to fly instead. And so Gagarin became the backup person. Komarov decided very quickly that this was a death trap. Maybe he'd make it, but probably not. And in fact, he told a KGB agent, if I fly on this, I'm not going to make it back. The problem was he knew if he didn't do it, Gagarin would. And Gagarin actually begged him not to fly on this flight. But he wouldn't do it because he didn't want anything to happen to Gagarin. They launch into space. 
He manages to make it into Earth orbit. There are all sorts of problems. Everything's going wrong, but he manages to get into a position where he actually can re-entry. The problem is, after re-entry, the parachute doesn't open. And basically, the spacecraft is in free fall until it hits the ground. And essentially, the CIA listened in, in much the way that the brothers claimed that they had listened in, on the transmissions from the capsule to Moscow. And it basically was Komarov just letting the Russians have it for the entire time between when he re-entered to when he hit the ground and died instantly. He's like cursing the space program and cursing the Soviet leadership and saying a bunch of words that would get us a, a big R next to our podcast. So I'm not going to repeat them, you know, stuff about Brezhnev because he had nothing to lose, right? So he just let him have it. And he dies, obviously. Well, at this point, Gagarin goes from being the great hero of the Soviet Union to being a huge critic of the Soviet Union. And this is a big problem because you can't have your biggest hero criticizing you. Well, what do you do? You can't arrest him. You can't execute him. He's too important to do that. But you need him to be dead. You need to be dead and be a hero. And wouldn't you know it, on March 27th, 1968, Gagarin is killed in a routine test flight of a MiG-15. This crash was shrouded in secrecy. It has never been fully explained. It has never been fully investigated. And in fact, the Russian government has repeatedly refused to reinvestigate the crash even to this day. You do not want to be on the bad side of the Russian government is what we're quickly finding out, and we didn't need this podcast to tell you that. All this is is there are certain things that we don't know for sure, obviously. There are things that we don't know if they are part of a deep fake, but whether they are confirmed or a lesser extent of what is believed to have happened is confirmed. And so what we do know is that People important in the space program are routinely killed. They disappear. They kind of disappear from images and lore within the Russians. And they are all seemingly interchangeable. I mean, can you imagine, Brett, if like you were recruited to go on a mission specifically because the person who was slotted to do it is too important to die? And they're like, but you're OK to die. <laughs> Why don't you go and test drive this for us instead? Because you're a little bit less important. But really, that's how the Russians ran their space program. And in some ways, you know, you kind of needed that ruthlessness if they wanted to be the first in space. But that's exactly what it was. It was utterly ruthless. And remember, th these are incredibly smart, accomplished cosmonauts. They aren't necessarily just interchangeable. It was once in a lifetime opportunity. And also they had to study. They had to be smart enough. They had to be the, in the right place at the right time. And they would be a national hero in and of themselves, each one of them. But they are all being kind of pawns in this space race that is going on. So there you have our timeline. And if you can't tell from that timeline, there's a lot of unusual aspects to discuss. I'm back to talk to you about one of our favorite sponsors, HelloFresh. Recently, I was getting ready for an interview. I was running around with the kids, and I hadn't eaten anything. Thank goodness we had HelloFresh. We were able to whip up the pork stir-fry with crispy onions, and it hit the spot. And it was fast, and it was easy, and it was affordable. And that's what makes HelloFresh one of our favorite sponsors and America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh does more than just delicious dinners. Not only can you take your pick from 40 weekly recipes, but you can choose over 100 items to round out your order from snacks and easy lunches to desserts and pantry necessities. Everything arrives in one box on a delivery day you choose. HelloFresh is easy and it gives you more options. And it can make dinner time a snap with deliciously easy options that will please everyone at your table. From a fit and wholesome to pescatarian to veggie, they have a meal plan that suits your lifestyle. Plus, you can swap out proteins and sides to your liking. And I promise you, your kids are going to like it. Alice isn't here to say that her kids gobbled it up, but mine did. My son, who is a notoriously picky eater, I gave him some of that pork and he could not get enough. So it is time for you guys to join us on the HelloFresh bandwagon because we're not getting off anytime soon. Go to HelloFresh.com slash TP16 and use code TP16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash TP16 and use code TP16 for 16 free meals 
plus free shipping, and you can find out for yourself why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. You know, we're all so busy out there, and one of the questions you should ask yourself is, how much time are you spending on yourself in any given week versus how much time you spend on other people? How do you balance the two? It is so easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. We do it all the time. We're trying to be helpful. We're trying to be thoughtful. And sometimes we lose sight of our own needs. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. And that's really where BetterHelp can come in. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash prosecutors today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash prosecutors you won't regret it angie's list is now angie and they've made it easier than ever to get all your home projects done right i've been really busy and i actually had my refrigerator broke but thankfully i was able to look on angie to have an appliance repair person come and fix my refrigerator it was so easy so amazing and all i had to do was click on a couple links and they got me the best prices for an appliance repairman Angie has over 20 years of home service experience, and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Just bring them to your project online or with the Angie app and answer a few questions and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or help you see ratings and reviews, compare quotes from local pros and connect instantly, which means you can cross things off your to-do list in just a few taps. Because whether it's routine maintenance or a dream remodel, Angie is here to make it easy. So get your next project done with the help of a pro from Angie. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. So we're back to talk more about Masterclass, one of my favorite new sponsors on the show. You guys know I'm a lifelong learner. I believe in it. I like to know how things work. I like to learn about history. It's one of the best parts about living is figuring things out. And that's where Masterclass can come in. You can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. With over 180 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do, that you've always wanted to know, is closer than you think. You can learn how to do anything from writing a book or a screenplay to just writing a letter. You can learn how to communicate with your boss or your family. Whatever you're interested in, there's a class for you. Cinema quality classes that give you unparalleled access to a renowned instructor. And you can explore lessons in any order you'd like across your phone, tablet, Apple TV, computer, and on the go with audio mode. And look, they get it. You're busy. Lessons of approximately 10 to 15 minutes in length fit easily into your everyday life. So what are you waiting for? It is time for you to give Masterclass a chance. I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every class. And as a prosecutor's listener, you can get up to 35% off for Mother's Day. Go to masterclass.com slash prosecute now. That's masterclass.com slash prosecute to get up to 35% off for Mother's Day. The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates and you can find a great rate that works for you even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. 
Press play and comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. One of those is a list of some of the suspected lost cosmonauts that those brothers claim to have recorded. Now, this is all according to the 14 Times. And again, it's suspected because they're not confirmed by the Russians, certainly not. But what we have is quite the list. I'm going to list through them really quickly for you so you can see how many we're talking about. May 1960, an unnamed cosmonaut lost when his orbiting space capsule veered off course. February 1961, the brothers recorded the suffocation of a cosmonaut. April of 1961, just prior to Yuri Gagarin's flight, a capsule circled the Earth three times before re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. May 1961, weak calls for help from an orbiting space capsule are captured by the brothers. October of 1961, a Soviet spacecraft veered off course and vanished into deep space. November 1962, a space capsule bounced off the Earth's atmosphere during re-entry and disappeared forever. April 1964, cosmonaut seems to be lost when a capsule is burnt up on re-entry. So I just listed seven potentially lost cosmonauts to you. And what you notice here is that despite these potential failures, really, let's just call them failures, whatever they are, because even if no one was lost during them, the Russians confirmed that these quote unquote unmanned space vehicles were were failed. They didn't stop, right? We have February 1961, April 1961, May 1961. Usually when you're losing life or you're losing these like incredibly expensive space machines, you take a break to study what went wrong in order to get all your ducks in a row, make sure it doesn't happen again before you relaunch. But here you can see really what they're doing. It's like the front lines. As soon as the front lines are knocked down, push more people to the front lines because we have to win this space war. Safety is really not at the top of the to-do list for the Russians here. They're like, failure, do it again. Failure, do it again. Failure, do it again. The problem is, if these failures included lies, that is a stunning loss and disregard for life in order to win something like the space race. And that's not even all of them. That's just some of them that they claim to record where something like this happened. And Alice is right. The Soviets were willing to do anything to win this race. And what we know for certain, whether you believe anything we've said up to this point, Know this, they absolutely covered up bad news, including bad news that had to do with their space program. And we've talked about some of this before. The Kishtum nuclear disaster in Chelyabinsk in 1957 was the worst nuclear disaster until Chernobyl and is still the third worst in history. And yet the Soviets were able to hide its existence until the 1970s, and even then, people didn't know what a big deal it was. Chernobyl itself would have remained a secret, were not for its sheer size and inability to cover up. Now, it might make sense to keep your nuclear program a secret, since so much of it happens behind closed doors anyway, but even with the eyes of the world on the Russian space program, they still managed to keep much of it a secret, especially their failures. On October 23rd, 1960, right in the middle of this time period we've been talking about, a rocket exploded in Balkanar Cosmodrome, killing 165 scientists and technicians. This event was not acknowledged by the Russians until 1990. That's how long years they later. were able to cover it up. 30 years, over 100, nearly 200 people killed, hundreds more injured. And they kept it secret for 30 years. And you know what's shocking about that? The, okay, so keeping it quiet for more than a generation, it's not like it's just those 165 people who were killed. They have families and contacts and friends. You have one missing person typically in today's world, and like Reddit goes crazy with, I last saw them this time, I TikToked with them this time, you know, all these sorts of things. But to be able to keep it quiet when there's such a vast conspiracy is amazing. We talk about this all the time, that conspiracies are hard to keep 
a secret because when you have two or more people involved, it's really hard to keep both or more people silent. Someone will eventually break. Man, the Russians are masters at keeping things quiet. In March 1961, Valentin Bodorenko, one of the first cosmonauts and the youngest, was killed as a result of a fire during a training exercise. His best friend, Yuri Gagarin, sat at his bedside until he died of third degree burns across his whole body. This was a horrific and painful death, and the Soviet Union didn't just cover up his death. They actually attempted to remove any evidence of his existence. I mean, talk about cold-blooded. This is not just, oh, he disappeared. We don't know who he is. I mean, this is, they are trying to erase him from the face of the planet. The Soviet Union destroyed all record of Bodorenko's involvement in the cosmonauts and any records of his life. They erased his image from photographs of other cosmonauts. I mean, this is straight up out of like Back to the Future, where people start disappearing from pictures. They are doing this in order to erase his very existence, any trace of him. And it wasn't until 1986 that anyone even knew about Valentin. If the Soviets were willing to go this far just to cover up the death of a cosmonaut during a training exercise, what would they do to cover up the deaths of cosmonauts? in the race to put the first man in space. And it's so bad with Valentin. There is a plaque on the moon that includes all the names of cosmonauts and American astronauts that we know about who died during the space race that we put up there when we landed on the moon, including both the Soviets and the Americans. His name's not on it because nobody knew about him because they'd covered it up so effectively. So this is an example of a lost cosmonaut that absolutely happened. He didn't make it to orbit. He died in a training accident. But nevertheless, he is a cosmonaut who died in the service of the Soviet Union, who they completely covered up. And we know about that for a fact. And what else we know for a fact is that of the original cosmonauts, no fewer than nine had been airbrushed out of official photographs released in the 70s. We know that one of them killed himself, at least that's what we're told. Another left the program after an accident. That one pretty much did happen. And another simply disappeared without a trace following another car accident. But what happened to the rest is a complete mystery. Yuroslav Golvanov, a high-ranking official in the Soviet space program, who ran cosmonaut training for 20 years, would later admit that six or eight cosmonauts had died in accidents. But how, when, and where, he never disclosed. Now, so far, we've been taking the brothers' claims as true, but there are problems with what they claim. And first, it's probably not possible for them to have intercepted every single communication they claim to have collected. There's basically no important space event that they did not claim to listen in on. Due to the curvature of the Earth and a bunch of principles that, honestly, I don't understand, Brett, because I'm not a physicist or an astronaut, I barely do math anymore. Another life I did, but no longer do I do math. There are only certain times a person in any one place could hear a transmission. And yet, basically every time there is a tragic event happening in the space race, they are claiming to catch it. They'd have to be in the exact right place at the right time, and they wouldn't know where to be or where when it would happen, but yet they're able to catch it every single time. Second, it is difficult, if not impossible, to transmit during re-entry. The plasma created by a re-entering spacecraft is significant and disrupts communication. However, it's worth noting that the recordings in question are one-way transmissions. There's no response from mission control. So it's certainly possible that the brothers were able to receive some emergency transmissions that no one else, even the Soviets, ever heard because they weren't actually transmitted both ways. Third, some have said that the cosmonauts are not following protocol in these recordings. Brett kind of mentioned that with the use of slang and not speaking as cosmonauts. But given that these people are in mortal danger, they know their death is in pending. Perhaps that's not surprising. You kind of lose it. I curse a lot more when I think an accident's about to happen, for example, because I don't have control over what I'm thinking and how I say it. Now, one other thing that is interesting, the audio that we just listened to earlier was, as we noted, from a woman. If one were going to fake a transmission from the Russians, one questions whether you do it with a woman. Now, everyone in the Western space program was male, and that was just 
the way things were. Women have made it very far these days and even now. I mean, of the, I think, four people who they just announced from the United States going to the moon, one is a female, right? So it's still a pretty male-dominated field. And you would just wonder if you were going to fake a transmission, wouldn't you fake it with a man? Because that's just there are more men in the space programs. And in fact, there were no women at all in the Western space programs. But think about this for a moment. If it was the Russians, and this was not a fake transmission, a female cosmonaut actually makes sense. First, the Soviets were a little less strict in their gender roles than the West. It would not be shocking to have a female cosmonaut, while that would be almost unimaginable in the United States at the time. And the Soviets were all about firsts. And having the first woman in space would have been important to them. On June 16th, 1963, they accomplished just that when Valentina Tereshkova orbited the Earth 48 times the only woman to this day to have gone on a solo space mission. And I think that does. That adds some credibility to it. Because if you're already faking it, why add that extra level of difficulty? Yeah, their sister speaks Russian. They could have found somebody else who spoke Russian. Or they could have had her write out a script for them. And they could have had a man read the script. So it's certainly interesting to me that they chose to do that. And it fits with what the Russians were doing. And that kind of brings us full circle. One one full orbit if you will. What about this whole story about the cosmonaut who flew off into deep space? Is what we started with. Could that have happened? Well, here's the story. It turns out that on November 28th, 1960, Bochum Space Observatory in West Germany intercepted a signal that might have been from a new Russian satellite, but there had been no official launch announcement made by anyone, which was a little unusual because when the Russians sent up satellites, they made sure everybody knew about it. The brothers heard about this and were very interested in it, and so they dialed in on the signal. They're in their little place. They're waiting for this the signal to come towards them. When it does, they're able to locate it. Now, it took them about an hour to isolate it so they could actually hear it, but when they did, they heard a series of dots and dashes that they recognized immediately. S-O-S. S-O-S is Morse code, and the reason we choose S-O-S is because they're the most identifiable letters in Morse codes. Three dashes, dash, 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 dot, 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 dash, dash, dash. And when you heard that on Morse code on a wireless from a ship or from a spacecraft, you knew there was a problem. They didn't have to explain anything else. What was strange about this, though, is unlike most of the signals they heard, although it faded away, as you would expect, the longer you're listening to it, it's going to fade away, It did not pass beyond their receiver's range over the band in the sky the receiver could track. Let me break that down a little bit. In other words, unlike a normal satellite in orbit around the Earth, it sort of passes over the range where the brothers could hear into the range of their receiver. They can hear it as it's going overhead. And then at some point, it goes around the curvature of the Earth to the extent that you would just lose it. You couldn't hear it anymore, and they were used to that. They got that all the time, but that's not what they had here. Instead, they were able to continue to listen to this signal for much longer than they should have been able to listen to it, even though it was gradually growing more faint. And that's when they realized something. It was fading out not because it was passing around the earth, but because it was getting further and further away from it. The theory then is as simple as it is chilling. This was a rocket that had left the Earth's orbit was someone inside drifting further and further away from the Earth with no ability to return to it. The obvious question, did the Soviets have the technology to achieve this feat even if by accident? Leaving Earth's orbit is actually pretty difficult, particularly if you want to go into deep space, and it requires multiple booster rockets. So you've all seen the, the various launches that we see all the time, there are, there are rockets that sort of take the spacecraft up into space. If you've ever seen the Apollo 11 launch, the main booster breaks away, another booster fires. You have to have multiple stage rockets to both get you into orbit and then get you out of it. And critics have said that the Russians did not have this capability until the late 60s. But that's not entirely true. We know that the Russians clearly had it as early as 1965. They acted like they didn't, but they certainly had it as early as 1965. Whether they had it as early as 1960 is hard to say. But given that this capability was necessary to reach the moon, and that was the Soviets' ultimate goal, 
it would not be surprising if they were experimenting with these kinds of rockets much earlier than we thought, and that in this case, it went horribly wrong. And so maybe it's true. Maybe deep in the recesses of space, so far away from the Earth that the sun itself is just a dot in the sky, there's a Soviet cosmonaut traveling endlessly in eternal darkness. And maybe he will be the first person to leave the solar system, even if in death. And maybe one day we'll catch up. We should just end it on that because that was so poetic. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's a great story. It's a great question. I love it. It's one of my favorite. My favorite thing about the Soviet Union is their conspiracy theories are believable. So many conspiracy theories are not believable and, because like, well, you can't go And they're up. so the good. The totally good. Because whatever version of the truth that exists is fascinating. Whatever can explain the parts of the facts that we know to be confirmed is going to be wildly interesting. That's what's so interesting about cases like this and Dyatlov Pass is there's likely not a boring explanation for what's happened here. It may not be exactly what we think it is, but I don't think it's a run-of-the-mill boring explanation right and that's the thing there is more to the story whatever the story is there's more to it the answer is not this is all just fake there's more to the story i 100 percent believe that i hope one day we know more maybe some of this is fake maybe the recording we played is fake maybe the guy never left orbit but there were things going on there that i i 100 percent believe were were happening and were real and there was a real race to put the first person in space and the Americans are trying to do it and the Soviets are trying to do it. You're not going to convince me that the Soviets, who were willing to cut corners, and we know that, and people died because of it, succeeded on their first try with Yuri Gagarin. Now, I mean, maybe nobody ever made it up there, but it wouldn't shock me if people died in launches, explosions on the pad. We know, as that one person said, six to eight cosmonauts died in accidents. Who were those people? And I don't know. I don't know. It's a fascinating question. I'm really interested. I hope you guys are interested in it, too. would love to hear your thoughts. Shoot us an email, prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod for all your social media. Leave us a five-star review and leave a question, and we will answer it. Alice, if you have some time, I've got some questions from people who've been taking advantage of the five-star review thing. All right, let's, get, let's get some questions. Okay, Absolutely. let's get some questions. Baby's still sleeping. This is a new feature. <laughs> new feature on the podcast. If you're leaving a five-star review and you're, you're leaving a question, we're taking those questions, and we will answer them. Let's go ahead and get a few things out. Number one, the person who, who was upset at us for making fun of reviews Sorry, we're going to keep doing that. If you leave a one-star review, and particularly if you say if you say mean, sexist things about Alice, you're going to get made fun of. Well, That's here's the, the thing, guys. We won't make fun of them if you don't send it out for us to make fun of, right? Like, you are welcome to all of your opinions, but you're also welcome to not plaster them all over, <laughs> like, our foreheads. <laughs> and so, yeah. if you're going to stick it on my forehead, I'm going to do what I want with it. And, you know, the thing about it is, we can't respond to you on Apple, which you, you know, people know, well know, well know, but... If you're going to tweet about us and say bad things, don't tag us. That's a silly thing <laughs> to do. It just makes it just so easy to respond us. to you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I appreciate you stabbing me in the front instead of the back. But, I mean, it's just, it's a little weird. Anyways, so that's the first thing. <laughs> Second thing to clear up. We had one person who thought that when we were talking about Murdaugh, and I talked about that one documentary with that crazy lady from the local town who just hated the Murdochs so bad and thought Paul was a, just an evil person. It was just completely out of the blue and there was no, it was unclear what their connection was. Somebody thought we were talking about his girlfriend. We obviously know who his girlfriend is. No, his girlfriend, <laughs> like, not at all. That's not who we were talking about. We really were talking about the person. I can't remember her name, but she had no connection to the Murdochs at all. She had no connection. There are three, at least, documentaries. There's the Netflix documentary, which I think is the one with Paul's girlfriend. There's the HBO documentary. And then there's another one that's on, like, Peacock or Hulu or something. That's the one with the lady. And if you see that, you will know what I'm talking about. It's just, she's just somebody from the community who really doesn't like him. So, no. We knew when we watched. I don't know how you could watch the Netflix documentary and not know that was his girlfriend, since that was the whole point of the first episode. But I just want to clear that up. So with that out of the way, let's get to questions. Okay, Alice, this is from Jenna. She wants to know, if you could have one case fully exposed for you, all of the information, all of the details, who done it, everything, soup to nuts, 
which case would it be? And I'll just go ahead and say, I'm going to go with the Atlov pass on this. I, that you would absolutely say that. For me, it would be John Bonet. We spent, what, almost a dozen episodes discussing it. I don't think we'll ever really know the answer. So I would save my, you know, know everything for a day, queen for a day card for John Bonet because I don't think in our lifetime or any lifetime we'll ever truly know everything that happened. Yeah, there's so many cases. I mean, there's like, my personal interest would be the Atlov pass. I would love to know Evansdale, just because those girls need justice. You know, Maura Murray, obviously, would be great to know. I mean, there's so many cases that that's a, I mean, that's a great question because of that, because there's so many answers, and it's a, it's a tough one to answer. Okay, Susie wants to know if we've ever seen a defendant take the stand and have it work out. Hmm. No. Well, I mean, in, in my personal life, no. Yeah, oh, right, right. In my personal <laughs> life, no. In our, in our professional lives, no. So I've had the defendant only take the stand for trials. You wouldn't really trot out the defendant for like substantive hearings, like motions to suppress and whatnot. They may want to talk, but they really shouldn't. You usually save it all for trial. And I've seen it happen a couple times at trial where the defendant takes the stand and it has never accrued to their favor, partly because of this. A lot of defendants take the stand because they think they are so smart that they can pull the wool over the eyes of the jurors. And your average juror really can see right through it. And it makes it a very unsavory impression of someone when they think they're so haughty that they're so much smarter than you, right? You're just not going to really like it when someone is condescending to you. And so whether that person has something good to say or not, typically the kind of atmospherics they give off does not benefit them. Now, we have had a case we've talked about on here what worked out, which is the Katie Autry case in which the defendant in that case, who we feel pretty strongly was innocent, took the stand and was acquitted. And I think him taking the stand did help him out in that case. The eternal question of who's more likely to take the stand, somebody who's innocent or someone who's arrogant, I think there are a lot of arrogant, guilty people who take the stand in their own defense. And I don't know, it's so hard. And it's this is the thing we always talk about in jury, in Void Dyer, is do you think someone who doesn't take the stand is more likely to be guilty? Because a lot of people have that prejudice. If I was innocent, they tell themselves, if I was innocent, I'd get up on that stand and I would tell them, I'm innocent, I didn't do it. And I think that may or may not be true, but sometimes you just have to make a strategic decision about what you're going to do. So I don't know that you can read a lot into that other than... I think it is definitely the case that a lot of people who do take the stand, particularly when they're guilty, are the really arrogant people who think they're smarter than everybody else. So, okay, next question. This is from Player Underneath and from MST051014. So this this question from two people. If you did not become lawyers, what profession would you pursue? Podcaster. I'm just kidding. (laughs) That's too easy. Well, you are good at it. Well, that's very nice of you. So I I really thought I was going to be an economist. I had applied for PhD programs, and I wanted to be like a researcher and write papers and run regressions all day. And then I realized that maybe I didn't want to live such a monastic lifestyle because academics is pretty monastic. And I wanted to fight more people, so (laughs) I became a lawyer instead. So maybe in a different world, if, you know, I had gone through with my degrees, I would have become an economist instead of a lawyer. So I'm going to assume that this allows me to have talents that I don't actually have. <laughs> so like in my current life, it's hard for me to even imagine what I would have been if I weren't going to be a lawyer, because I was just always going to be a lawyer. I was a philosophy and history major in college. So I was either going to be a lawyer or I was going to starve to death. So I guess I would have had to have done something different in college. I, I've always been impressed by doctors, so I guess... That would have been something I could have tried. But more interestingly, if I could have talents I don't have, I would want to play Javert in Broadway productions of Les Mis. Wow, Brett, I did not know this about you. Javert is my favorite character, basically, in in anything. And Les Mis is, you know, a, a true phenomenon. But wow, I didn't know. Okay, that's a fair point. I would have loved to be a performer in another life if that would have, like, you know, I could feed myself doing it. Well, the world knows you're a great dancer. So, I don't know that I'm a know. great dancer, but I that is probably the happiest I've been in my life is performing on stage in like productions. So yeah, Economist was boring. I'd rather be a performer. So Catherine wants to know what I think caused the Bronze Age collapse. And the answer to that, obviously, is the Sea Peoples. And the answer to who the Sea Peoples were, obviously, is the Atlanteans. So duh, Catherine. So that's my answer to you on that. And then the last question for today is... From Mom, 5132, how are you guys so precious? So I'm not sure if that's your mom 
or my mom. It's but... definitely not my mom because my mom doesn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> and she definitely would not know how to leave a five-star review. Maybe a one-star review, but I do not believe my mom can leave a five-star review. So not my mom. It must be Mrs. Brett. Mrs. Brett, mm, mom. Mm. Mrs. Brett, mom. Yeah, maybe it is. Okay, well, that's all the questions we have for today. But if you leave five-star reviews and leave a question, I will add you to the list. It will answer later. And if your question hasn't been answered yet, don't worry. I have you on the list. Just have to get to it. If you don't hear your answer and... You know, a few episodes, send me an email or something to remind me. But we're going to keep doing that because that's a lot of fun and I enjoy that. Well, Alice, is there anything else you want to add before we sign off for today? It's been so great to we're have back. you back for a new we're episode. We're back. We're back. I, I No, Brett, it's just so good to be recording with you again. Thank you to Lidditz Elementary for your incredible research. So we actually spoke with them and they presented their research to us like I don't even think they knew this about 48 hours before I gave birth. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to hear their research before I went out. So the last thing I scheduled on my work calendar was to speak with Lidditz Elementary. So you guys know that now. They didn't know that at the time. But I'm so glad I did that. It was absolutely exactly what I wanted to do before I went out on maternity leave. And guys, the future is bright because we have some incredible, curious, rational thinkers who presented fantastic theories. And I hope that they all continue their great venture into research, into the into these types of mysteries, because they're good at it. And I think that we're going to be OK for the future generation. It is kind of crazy how much recording we did right before Alice had her baby. <laughs> you guys, all, you've all heard the the Murdoch, all 10 episodes by now. It was it was that, and then the Lidditz elementary thing, and then we we had all the lives for Murdoch when he testified, and when the verdict came down and all that stuff. So it was, it was amazing. And I do want to shout out to Alex, who is the teacher of the kids at Lidditz elementary, the sixth grade classes, who invited us to take part in that. We need more teachers like him. He's awesome, and, and thanks so much for the opportunity. Okay, guys, we'll be back next week with a new case, new questions, and maybe new answers. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. Alice, it's just so good to have you back. <sighs> so let's go back to October 4th, 1957. The Soviets launched Sputnik, the first artificial satellite. Two brothers, 25-year-old Achille? Achille? <laughs> yeah, this is going to be another one of we're those. Gonna, we're going to start I, off sure, real Achille good. Achille sounds I'm going to go with great. Achille. Okay. Brothers, 25 year old Achille and 18 year old Gian Battista Judica Corda. Oh no. Judica Cor it's Cordiglia. <laughs> That's beautiful. Not the way I said it, but it, how it would actually be said. We're lost in accidents prior. We're lost in accidents during attempts to put a spur. You got it, Alice. <laughs>
See what's screaming all month long during Pluto TV's April Ghouls. Watch hauntingly good movies like Evil Dead and Cloverfield, or terrifying shows like The Walking Dead and Nosferatu. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies and TV shows. Available on live and on demand. Download the free Pluto 